conserving blue carbon ecosystems like seagrass, mangroves and marshlands is important because they store three times more carbon than forest and land ecosystems. They also provide jobs and income to local economies, improve water quality, support healthy fisheries and provide coastal protection. However, it is estimated that half of the global mangrove cover has disappeared in the last 40 years. Did you know Sri Lanka was designated as a global mangrove champion under the Commonwealth Blue Charter? Over the next decade, Dilma Conservation will commit to restore and conserve over 24 acres of degraded mangrove forest in Sri Lanka. We are collaborating with governmental organizations, local communities, educational institutes and other corporates. We aim to create a replicable model which will restore mangrove and shallow marine ecosystems with socio-economic development by the year 2030. Mangroves are a unique ecosystem, a special ecosystem, and a vulnerable ecosystem. But we can protect the mangroves together. The ocean. Our island is surrounded by it. We live in the midst of it. Mesmerizing. Enthralling. Pleasing. Our ocean is unique, a vibrant marine habitat. We have loyal whales who never leave our seas. Turtles who always return to our shorelines. Mangroves sequestering carbon. Dugons gliding beneath the waves. Seagrass meadows pumping oxygen we breathe. Underwater reefs sheltering marine life. But they're struggling. Coral reefs bleached. Our seabeds scraped over by foreign fishing trawlers. We're depleting our marine life through overfishing. Plastic and chemical waste pollution gush into our oceans. Coastal sand is disappearing. Marine animals killed by dynamite. Turtles entangling in goose nets. Ships colliding with whales. Climate change. Global warming. Oil spills. Coastal construction. Ocean acidification. 
ocean's life is draining. We need the ocean. Our survival depends on it. The sea around us is now a hot spot for geopolitics, trade, security, maritime ventures, and crime. Our impact on the ocean matters. Our ocean is our lungs, our hearts, our nerves. Without it, no one can survive. We can only thrive if our oceans survive. Let's strive to be the guardians of the ocean. Let us be the protectors together for our ocean. Hello everybody, my name is Praveen Bandara and I am a team member of the Pearl Protectors. I would like to welcome you all today to the World Ocean Day Summit, where today's session is on science, innovation towards a sustained ocean, under the theme, The Way Forward for Our Ocean. Uh, well, the World Ocean Day Summit is hosted by the Pearl Protectors in partnership with Marine Environment Protection Agency, Blue Resource Trust, and the World Ocean Day Organization. You can learn more about our summit on pearlprotectors.org and watch all our sessions on our social media platform. In this session, we will be discussing about the technologies and innovations that are utilized in research, exploration, and conservation of our oceans. We will look at some of the novel technologies and innovations that can be adopted in Sri Lanka and how science can help reverse the effects of ocean degradation. We have got some great guests today to talk about the topic. Introducing Dr. Sewandi Jayakodi, who is a senior lecturer at Vyamba University. Dr. Asha Divos, who is the founder of Oceanswell and the founder of the Blue Whale Project. And we also have Professor Charita Patiarachi, who is a Winthrop Professor of Coastal, Coastal Oceanography at the University of Western Australia. Welcome, everybody. I would like to request all our audience to send us any questions you may have. We will try to answer all the questions after the discussion round. Simply add your questions to the comment section on either Facebook or YouTube. So to start off, um, I would like to ask Dr. Asha, in your research work with the Blue Whale Project, which is the first long-term study of blue whales in the Indian Ocean, you study the whales' feeding patterns, their habits, and their health. Uh, with the available funding, what tools are at your disposal for your daily research work? And what innovations have you had to develop to successfully carry out your work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, to start off, one of the key things that we do is we use when we say technology, I think sometimes we think of these really fancy things, but we use a drone, which is now a very commonplace item. People have them that they, you know, do just do videos on their over their backyard, but it can also be used as a scientific tool um, if it's used properly. So we use drones to actually look at things like the interaction between whales and boats or the boats and whales out in water. That's really important to us as part of our work with understanding the whale watching industry, but also understanding the interactions of ships with whales. Apart from that, we can also use drones to look at the health of these animals. Now, when you see this animal right from the surface, we are only, if I'm on a boat, I only see parts of the animal's body at a certain time. And that can, um, that can, that makes it a little difficult for me to really understand what condition this animal is in. 
But when we have a drone up in the air, we're able to do calculations on the girth of the animal and accordingly measure year after year these same populations that come into our waters to look at what their health situation might be like. Also, there are telltale marks like where the fat has kind of dropped away. Uh, we can take lots of imagery around that. So it's been really great to be able to use this tool. But I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, very briefly about other tools. Like we, again, technology gives us the sense that it has to be expensive and fancy, but it doesn't. Technology is basically any tool that you have around you that you can use to answer a question, right? That's really how I see it. So even when we do our work with the blue whales and we work a lot with whale poop, as many of you might know, and we collect it for various purposes to understand stress levels, to look at um, what their diets are. You know, across the world, people use very fancy nets to do this, but we use a tea strainer, right? And at the, at the start, a lot of people in universities abroad were like, how can you use a tree strainer to do this? And I was like, but it's the same purpose, right? All I'm doing is collecting this, sieving out the water, putting it into a jar, preserving it, and putting it in my freezer for analysis. So I want to start off this session by reminding all of us that technology is great, but technology is basically anything you can use to answer some of the questions uh, that we all have. And I don't want you to get carried away and think that if you don't have something fancy or expensive, you can't actually do the work on the ground. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I'd like to come to Dr. Sewandi. Um, you carried out a survey of the coastal of the coral reefs in Sri Lanka for the coral atlas uh, in partnership with Vulcan Inc. Could you explain a bit about this project, the equipment that was used uh, and the expertise brought in by Welcome that facilitated the mapping. Dr. Professor, you're on mute. Professor, your mic is mute. Thank you. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. OK, yeah. So uh, there are two things here. Technology that is very simple. All we need to be uh, innovative in deciding what to use, just like Asha mentioned. And then there's also a technology that is out there, which is not known to us. It's a matter of just looking for it and then adopting. And that's exactly what happened with uh, Vulcan's initiative. Uh, it was sort of like a series of random meetings, to, um, meeting people outside and coming to know that there is this technology out there with uh, Paul Allen Trust and that they have basically mapped the entire ocean of uh, focusing on corals. So that when we came to know about it, then the next thing was that how do we get the satellite imagery? Because as you obviously know, satellite imagery is quite expensive and accessing it is quite difficult. But then when you uh, when you are coming from a developing country, especially when you when you have the passion to do work, nothing is impossible, and that's exactly what I found. Because uh, with the support of the Ministry of Environment and Ministry of uh, Wildlife, we uh, then managed to have a partnership with all the other national agencies, convince them about the use of this imagery, and then we managed to get the required uh, spectral bands, uh, the right pixel sizes, and also the processed images. So that, that, that has enabled us to do lots of new things. What do I mean by new things? Number one, you know, up to now, we've been depending on our, the knowledge that we have gathered by diving and sort of getting into different areas to look for coral reefs. But this particular uh, set of like uh, opportunity enabled us to look at the existing coral reefs from a very different point of view, from a different angle, so that now we have a comprehensive uh, map that indicates all the detected reefs around the country in the uh, shallow areas. And that has now paved a pathway to Department of Wildlife Conservation and other agencies to look at how do we ground through these locations and what are the areas that can potentially be protected. So, Innovation is out there sometimes, just a matter of looking for it and uh, sort of like getting it. And that's exactly the same thing we are doing with uh, mangroves too. Global Mangrove Watch had been collecting lots of data and that data is freely available. So 
for all, all the restoration work that is going on at the moment, we are using their information and we are validating them at the ground level. So sometimes our job is as simple as ground truthing because all are. Thank, all, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, now coming on to Professor Patiarachi, uh, you were uh, you for your work in studying uh, and predicting physical features of the ocean through simulation. Uh, data gathering is an important part. Uh, can you tell us about the ocean gliders that you use in your work and what information it gives you, how you use it? So ocean gliders are uh, autonomous vehicles um, that uh, we deploy in the ocean and they basically change their density for going up and down through the water column. It collects temperature, salinity with depth, including chlorophyll and sediments and dissolved oxygen. Where my ha my left hand is inside is our um, the science engine, which is basically got a SIM card, just like your phone. When it comes up to the surface, it makes a phone call um, and then we can control it. Um, and that data is uh, highly valuable uh, to be used for weather forecasting, etc. But also we uh, use the data for looking at daily, seasonally, interannual variability of all of those parameters. They're pretty robust. We can put them under tropical cyclones, under storms. And uh, two or three years ago, we sent one from Australia to Mirissa, and it took 11 months to get there. Um, so uh, this is the new way that we're collecting data uh, that ultimately will go on to having better weather forecasts and also a better understanding of the ocean system. Thank you, Professor. Um, that's interesting to know that uh, the ocean glider actually worked autonomously for 11 months uh, on its uh, just through remote uh, operation. Uh, actually, uh, coming on to the similar simulations and mapping which you've done, Professor, uh, you do map the transport of buoyant debris, uh, which was part why you were involved in the mapping of the debris from the disappeared flight MH370. Uh, can you tell us uh, what data was used in that simulation and the information that was extrapolated from uh, them? So How to to track buoyant debris, whether it's plastics or from a um, debris from an aircraft, eggs and larvae uh, from different animals, uh, turtle hatchlings, a whole variety of them, you need two components. One is that you need the ocean currents, the surface currents of the ocean. We say the first one meter, we need to get data on that currents, both spatially and temporally, and depending on the different uh, applications, uh, we can use global models if you're going to run for many years and you're looking at, let's say, something going across the ocean basin, uh, or if you're actually looking at a, uh, a coral reef and look at where the eggs and larvae of the coral might end up, they, then you need a different resolution. So you, you need the currents or what we call advection fields from one hand, you also need the waves and you need the wind. Uh, and then all of that, we put it into a, what we call a particle tracking model. And particle tracking model is basically, you put an orange in the water and you track where it goes. We track the parcel of water that may be going and we can track them for, in the computer, many long ways. But then you can simulate the type of particle there is. Is it in the surface all the time? Is it out of the uh, surface so that the wind has an effect? Does it sink after some time? Uh, eggs and larvae, some of the fish uh, will, will come into uh, a, have a swimming ability. And then can you simulate that swimming as well? So we basically program all of that into the computer. And then we run the model to find out where things may end up. Thank you, Professor. There's quite a bit of variables you need to add into the uh, simulation. Um, 
it um, actually coming to Dr. Asha, um, it's also a well-known fact that remote operated vehicles are required in marine biology research, especially considering the need to observe life in deeper parts of the ocean. Uh, what has your experience been in using ROVs for your research work and what scope does that provide? Yeah, wonderful. So <clears throat> I've been very lucky in that I have had the opportunity to um, work with an ROV um, aboard the Ocean X, which is a vessel that I was on recently. Um, and this ROV has the capacity to go down to 6,000 meters, right? So these are places that we will never be able to go without technology, right? The deep ocean, one of the key things about the deep ocean is that we're very, very limited um, by the unavailability of um, sort of these the equipment like this. And not a lot of people own these things. So the ROV is really great. It's basically... <clears throat> A device that's dropped into the water it's tethered to the vessel so it's connected to the vessel at all times it's dropped into the ocean we can decide where it goes you can set a gps point for example and then drop it and then it will kind of try to locate itself in that position so what we would do is typically find an interesting feature underwater maybe you know is there is there a kind of a uh, a seamount that we want to look at or is there a pinnacle underwater where we think there might be an aggregation of life is there something we want to observe because these rovs have cameras they we can film very very high resolution on them they have uh, arms right so they have hands for collecting things there are different kinds of hands so you can have very robotic hands that can pick up basically jars and almost like fill them up underwater and close them but you can also have uh, squishy fingers as they're called very very tender fingers that are designed to be able to pick up things like jellyfish if you need to take samples right because the un the deep sea is very different in life to what we see on on the surface and so to gain more of an understanding these rovs are really really uh, incredible and the cool thing about an rov is that you can quantify what you're doing so you can do a transect so you can basically travel this trans this rov in a straight line for a predetermined amount of time and as you go you can film everything along the way right directly under you and you can use tools then once you put it into your computer to basically quantify define what's the substrate what does the sub bottom look like is it rocky is it sandy and then what species are you seeing along the way? So there's a lot of like functionality. These things can do a lot of things um, and you can add and subtract tools as well. I mean, you can add a CTD on it, a conductivity temperature depth recorder, just like Chari puts on his gliders. Um, you can put a bait box down there. So you can basically drop some bait and see what deep sea shark species exist. So there's a whole lot of things you can do and it really starts to unravel what's going on in that deep underwater world. But you're sitting in a control center up on the surface while you do this, and you're just surrounded by a lot of monitors, computer screens, and someone's, mat, you know, basically, uh, it's like remote control cars, right? You're just like driving it from there. Thank you, uh, Dr. Asha. Actually, um, I wanted to also follow up with that. Um, in, in addition to ROVs, there is a use of manned submersibles as well. ROVs obviously give a larger depth to the use of it. But uh, in contrast to ROVs using manned submersibles, what is the scope of it and what are the, um, what's the capacity of using it in, in our water? Yeah, so certainly, you know, I'll tell you to start off, I mean, I'm very intrigued by the deep ocean because a lot of species that I study, like the sperm whales, for example, go deep, deep down there. And if I could get my hands on these kinds of equipment in our waters, I think there's a lot of questions I could start to answer. Um, but uh, submersibles are very different, right? There, you can get into it. You can put a number of people into it. So the one that I was in, again, on the Ocean X, there were three of us, the pilot and then two observers. Um, there are limitations because you have people. So obviously you can't necessarily go as deep without even more technology, right? Uh, so, so the depths of a submersible are typically much uh, less saying that, I mean, we were able to go down to a thousand meters, which I will say is quite an amazing thing, right? Uh, but for those of you who are wondering, it doesn't feel any different to if you're on the surface because it's obviously it's designed to just feel like a normal room that you're sitting in, it's quite small. but 
the advantage of that is that you're actually there observing as well, right? So in the ROV, you're sitting in mission control up on the vessel and you're controlling this thing remotely and it's sending it all over and doing stuff. Whereas in the sub, you are actually physically there. So one of the things you can do with that is if you detect a feature, say with the ROV, like a brine pool, which is a really cool, very highly saline uh, pools that are found in the deep ocean, you can actually go down there and observe that. If you want to do behavioral studies, subs are pretty cool because you can go and sit and watch things. You can stay there for um, many hours. Like I did an eight hour shift, but you can do longer. And in case of emergency, you can stay for four days, which I wouldn't advise anyone does. But uh, the point being that, so they have diff similar but different functionality. Uh, quantification um, is a little more difficult in a sub. Uh, but it does give you a totally different outlook on what's going on in the ocean. And you get to physically be in those deep, dark places, uh, which I will say is pretty amazing. Thank you, Dr. Asa. Um, actually, I would like to get to Dr. Sewandi now um, to ask about there are um, new technologies in tackling some of the current issues that Sri Lanka is uh, facing in terms of pollution, uh, especially specifically from fisheries harbors in terms of solid waste and ghost fishing net. Uh, according to your expertise, what technologies can be deployed to address these issues? OK, Praveen. So um, uh, from the management perspective, I think there are lots of things that we need to bring into Sri Lanka in terms of innovation. Uh, I would like to talk about it in, uh, in uh, focus in three areas. The very first thing is that I think um, we really need to handle is the ghost fishing gear. Uh, probably you must be aware now what you see is a map that we recently compiled with the CFAS UK, uh, a study that was done to look at the spread of uh, ghost fishing gear. And you can see with the observations that we received, uh, it's everywhere. And the uh, pictures basically give you the status of the grim scenario that is down there in the ocean. What, what is required now is that uh, we have to look at not just the fishing technique itself, we have to look at the material. Uh, material itself, how do we become innovative in coming up material that, that wouldn't uh, sort of create a damage to the ocean in this manner is some Thing that we need to discuss. Uh, that, that kind of discussions have started not just in Sri Lanka but also globally, but the options are very few. Now, think about something like monofilament gills. Monofilament gills, whenever we use it, like in, in many cases, monofilament gills are temporarily used because they are uh, sort of like after one season, fishermen just tend to sort of like forget about it. So, if that's the case, is there any possibility we can think about that kind of gills um, that 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 will self-destruct? That would uh, sort of like decay in the ocean itself rather than getting entangled. These these kind of innovations are very very important because from one side to improve our knowledge, Asha was talking a lot about how we can improve our knowledge with um, new innovations. At the same time, now innovation got to come into how uh, management, how we can use innovation in order to manage some of the problems. So uh, LDFG is one area where innovation is critically required. It can be as simple as uh, recycling and upscaling what is being collected. Because at the moment, we collect, uh, there are uh, voluntary organizations that collect large amount of ghost fish in the year annually. But there is no, nothing is happening to they are just taken from the ocean and taken back to the beach. But can we add some innovation and think of upscaling this material and create a viable market for that? So that's the kind of questions we need to ask and also find answers. Uh, same time, coupled with uh, ALDFG, then comes the bycatch. Bycatch is another really big problem. Now, when we talk about bycatch, there are two things. Well, number one is how do you reduce bycatch? 
um, from turtles to dolphins, that's the bigger bycatch. But then on a daily basis, the amount of gastropods and the uh, other uh, inedible fish that we bring in, uh, every time you do that, that's the ocean biodiversity that is brought in. How do we handle that problem? How do we change our gears in order to address these problems are going to be quite important. I think that's that's some, some area that we need to focus on. And to add that, I think it is also important that we talk about uh, bringing in innovation, not just with the technology, but also uh, innovation for communication. Because seafood industry is one of the largest industries on planet Earth. We need to uh, always remember that 12% of the global livelihoods are linked to it. But at the same time, we really don't have an accountability for this thing. So now there's more dialogue about how do we create accountability about fish industry. Because if there is accountability, I think half the uh, most of the conflicts related to fish can be uh, resolved. So is, uh, as we know that um, consumers in seafood industry is misled, there is hardly any information about from where they are caught, so on and so forth. So that in order to crack down these things, uh, probably you must be aware that there are certain uh, new ideas coming like fish coin, uh, traceability studies. That's where I think uh, innovation in communication, innovation, innovation in use in uh, uh, online platforms that no one can hack into, but a consumer and a producer can both look at the origin of the fish can be traced. That kind of innovations are also required for management. Uh, there are a lot more to talk about, but I think those two areas are critical for the ocean. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, actually, yes, accountability in the fishing industry is one thing that uh, needs to develop. Um, considering uh, that Sri Lanka actually needs to innovate and quickly adopt new technologies to protect our ocean and our resources, uh, what are the barriers uh, disabling us in adopting these available technologies, uh, Dr. Sewande? Dr. Sewande? Can you repeat the question, please? Sorry. Um, what are some of the barriers that are disabling us in adopting some of these uh, available technologies, seeing as we need to? I think uh, num uh, there, there's, there are a number of reasons. Number one is that innovation part of our curriculum. Is innovation something that we promote in this country, something that we have to first look at that there are uh, certain scientists, certain academics out there that are coming up with tiny innovations using local expertise, but they are example, I can quote uh, Dr. Saman Vijay Sekhar from my own university, who has been developing these solar dryers, quite cheap, but very in order to provide clean, dried fish. But that's just a purely an academic exercise. How can he be promoted into the next levels? How can he find the market? Who will support him to take it to the next level? So startup industries supporting innovations is a very important thing. That's one big barrier. We, we need to sort of like find ways to resolve that. And then the second thing is our just reluctance to what is freely available. Things that I was talking about to, to you earlier, like uh, Al Alan Coral. Atlas, it's freely available, but we don't touch it. Perhaps it's because it's freely available, but it's a wealth of information. And how do we blend in that kind of information, that kind of innovation into day to day management? Now, I know that, um, that Vulcan's uh, analysis has gone to the next level. They, they are predicting the sedimentation. So if you, if you want to look at after a flood, how the sedimentation is spreading around the country, that data available and that but yet i think there is a general reluctancy to cooperate and to get into teamwork and that barrier got to be broken even with the current disaster one thing i saw was that the moment everyone uh, sort of like came forward um, 
with whatever the expertise i know that uh, professor um, charita is one person that came forward very quickly to provide his expertise now those are the sort of like it's a part of the innovation innovation in our thinking that different people can bring in different information and that's going to be important so that's another barrier that i'm seeing then the, the third thing i see is that we really don't like changing we love doing business as it is but having real evidences that doing business as it is with the ocean is not going to help us so that is another barrier understanding where we are and also knowing certain ecosystems have got into the tipping point so that we really need to change our mindset and also the way we manage will allow and pave path for innovation thank you professor one uh, yes uh, truly uh, change is part of something we need to embrace in sri lanka um uh, coming to professor uh, patiyaraji um i actually want to uh, ask since fishing vessels and maritime traffic has seen an increase in our waters um it is prudent that we actually start monitoring and planning um and keep an eye out for our marine environment in your experience what equipment should be deployed in uh, this task Professor, you're on mute. I'm going to take you back on your comment. Unfortunately, we live in a reactive society as opposed to proactive society. Okay, it's not only Sri Lanka; all over the world. You look at a lot of the disasters which has happened. It's taken 20 or 30 years. for the pub the, the governments or the authorities to react to that single event and and this is you know you have to have more and we're trying to actually accept that and we try to close the barn door after the horse has bolted so but as we talk about innovation the innovation is there we have the tools we actually have the capability to do that but implementation and the desire from the authorities to be able to commit to develop and install these systems is the most important thing so in all of these systems um, unfortunately there is a lot of talk fest so I have been in Sri Lanka many times that we actually said you write a report after a workshop saying we need to do this but of course nothing happens right then um what is it the the diamond event happened yeah and then yep yep yeah we need to do something about it and then oh no ah nothing's going to happen again so we go back to our thing right so now express pearl what would happen do you think yes there is a hype to say where is the chemicals there is no chemicals we know that where is the oil we don't know whether there's oil in the ship or not and even if it is okay what would happen to the noodles where would they go we can say that now right? so what is the the desire from the people from the authorities from the politicians to do something about it the only different thing was that the tsunami of 2004 but that was because that it took almost 40 years to set up a tsunami warning system for the pacific ocean and that was already being talked about many meetings have happened and i was associated with many meetings and said no we don't need it we cannot actually have a 24/7 system right but of course when almost quarter of a million people died all of the countries got together and said we would actually now have a tsunami warning system and we established it that is a good record but we haven't really have a tsunami for almost 10 years do you think we are prepared I don't think so. Okay. 
because we have a different generation of people, a different generation of people in the villages, if you like, on the coastal areas. We have different generation of people who are in con not control, but trying to manage the tsunamis. And some of them actually haven't even experienced the tsunami because of the generation gap. So I train these people. I'm now on the third generation of trainees around the Indian Ocean. Right? So we trained the first lot of people 15 years ago. Of course, then they move on to different jobs and they get promoted. Then the next certain come in. And then now we actually have the third generation that we're going to do. But again, the technology is there, but the support of the countries, for example, trying to get just simple data as the ocean topography or the bathymetry is still a huge challenge, not only in Sri Lanka, the whole of the Indian Ocean. You probably heard about the Mauritius oil spill. That's exactly the same. But now they have actually set something up that they can do it. So proactive is the innovation that we want. Thank you, Professor. So it's up to everybody to push for um, in an implementation now that the innovation is actually available. Um, actually, coming to uh, one of the questions, uh, more timely questions with uh, Dr. Asha. Um, considering the following recent events with the Express for Professor Patia that you also spoke about, uh, there have been uh, it's a there have been quite a number of dead animals washing ashore, and it is public perception that the deaths are linked to the pollution of the derelict ship. The only way to identify this is through a post-mortem. Uh, would you, uh, I would like to ask if uh, what agency is supposed to carry this out in our examination? Uh, sorry, I think Dr. Asha disconnected. Um, um, yes. I don't know. Maybe Professor Savandi could say yeah. uh, it could be, um, I don't know, the wildlife people? Uh, Professor Sewandi, um, what? Um, Charlie, there's a lot of agencies that are working at the moment on the ground. So when it comes to uh, uh, species like turtles, dolphins, whales, uh, these uh, these species, their current situation in relationship to the uh, ship wreck is being dealt by Department of Wildlife Conservation. I was speaking to them even yesterday and they are at the moment trying to look at the assess the damage and also to work out what actually is the causative agents uh, agents for the deaths that they are encountering but in addition to that i know a gamut of organizations uh, now is at the moment looking at the water quality um so they are actually looking trying to uh, working with many other agencies trying to look at the long-term impact in terms of uh, changes to the food web itself because that's a cocktail of things down there so from phytoplankton to zooplankton and very importantly the changes that would happen to ichthyoplankton which is related linked to the fish are being also dealt with nara but itic uh, in central environmental authority they all and uh, they all have a, a role to play. But I think Asha is here, and she, she's the best person to go ahead with that question. Asha, I was sort of like taking up the question uh, that was posed to you. Uh, but I think now you are here, you will be able to handle it better. Uh, Dr. Asha, I uh, connected. OK, I it. apologize. I don't know if you can hear me. My connection isn't great. Yes. Uh, we can hear you. Would doctor. you be able to repeat the question quickly? Actually, the question was um, considering the recent uh, deaths of marine species, uh, the best way to find out uh, is to do a post mortem. So, what agencies are supposed to carry out these examinations and what's the scope of it and how is it being carried out? Doctor? Hang on, I'm very sorry. My internet's gone a little bit haywire, so I'm going to try to reconnect to something else. Is this any better? This is yes, Doctor. We can 
hear you properly. I don't know. I, I'm not sure what's going on right now. I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, but uh, I think uh, the answer is very much there. So it's yes, the Department yes. of Wildlife Conservation um, until Aisha comes in. Yeah. I think uh, that's the agency. And I think if you come to see any uh, stranded um, the turtle, it's really good that if you can inform the Department of Wildlife Conservation so that they, they can get a stock account and a total uh, idea about the picture. Yes. Asha, I think I went ahead uh, gave an answer to your uh, question. So it's since, um, dealt with. Yes, perfect. Uh, since um, our uh, connection, uh, connect, there's a connection issue with Dr. Asha, we'll actually move on to an audience question. Um, we have a question regarding the self deposition of coral reefs um, and what can be done to restore them. Um, I think uh, Professor Sewandi would uh, touch up on that topic a while back. Praveen, what's the question? Uh, regarding the self. Connection is not very really good. Yeah, I think uh, right now there has been, there seems to be a connection issue. Uh, there is an audience question. All oh, right, I saw the question. Yeah, yeah I saw the question. The self deposition. Yes. Uh, coral reefs around Sri Lanka are dying. Yes, I do agree with you. A multiple set of factors are um, the causative agent for uh, the death of reefs. Um, and uh, restoration, the word restoration, it's something that we have to be very careful with because these systems, especially coral reefs, are very uh, sensitive ecosystems and the way that uh, uh, you have to handle a degraded reef is quite unique. But you, we also need to understand that this is a system where even if you try to restore, if the age, if the reasons that results in degradation around it, or if it is coming back seasonally, it's not going to be helpful. And that's what we've been seeing. Uh, if you look at Bari, if Marine Sanctuary after 1998 um, uh, bleaching, the reef nearly died. There was very little live coral cover left. But as it was the war time and there were very little fishing happening, nature itself restored the system and also that resulted that it was also because there were less uh, ENSOs, El Nino Southern Oscillations at that time. But now the frequency of ENSOs are higher and as a result we are seeing many key reefs around the country they have passed the tipping point and they are now getting into new ecosystems which we need to I, assess and understand what they are. So uh, it's multiple factors, silt, elevated sea temperatures. But to a certain point, fisheries, uh, dynamiting, all that illegal activities that are happening. Um, but also, in, in addition to that, the nutrients that come with the rivers. And that's, that is why in places like that, innovation is important to study the recruitment, and water quality, uh, President Chalita was talking about all that. Time has come for us to have perhaps some permanent um, setups in at least some of the reefs that are still promising, that's, which we can uh, still take care of. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, considering the time, I'll quickly move on to uh, Professor Patiarati. There is a question regarding um, uh, what happens to the simulation model that have taken place after uh, disaster has occurred. Um, Professor Patel. It depends on who would be running. I mean, usually um, what we should be doing is, is having these systems in 24-7. They're the same systems that can pr uh, provide information to fishermen, how safe to go out. What are the wave conditions, etc.? We we don't actually have a system of safety to people. So the safety we are talking about, safety of fishermen, 
safety of ref recreational uh, recreational people who go to the beach, for example, um, and then safety of ships, fishing boats, etc. So these are all exactly the same information that we take that we would do to uh, get all of that information, whether it's an emergency or a routine forecast. Unfortunately, as I said, in a proactive, uh, in a reactive system, I just get a call sometimes in the middle of the night. Please help. What are we doing? How can you help? But again, hopefully, we you know we follow up and we you know the mantra keeps going on and on and on, repeating. But hopefully, one day, maybe when the next incident happens, it may happen. But it's a little, I mean, it's, it's not different to Australia either, right? It, uh, don't take me, this is not a criticism of Sri Lanka. It's virtually every country in the world. Um, and uh, it's when they actually finally decide, and it's the same for climate change as well. Um, and, and people are not prepared. You know, they will have an a, a inundation or a flooding event. Yes, it will happen. And then it will happen two or three times a year. And then it'll have 10 times a year. When would they actually say, we don't want this to happen anymore? Do something. Okay. So. Thank you, Professor. So we basically need to focus on a more preventive and preventive approach and a protection system than react to disaster. Yeah. Um, considering the time, I'd like to uh, get one more question. Um, and considering our next session is on youth engagement, um what should uh, i'll ask dr uh, asha i'll get to dr asha what changes should actually be brought in uh in the interest to increase the interest and in learning and getting people to work in the maritime related field and what challenges did you face back then and uh, what will the younger generation face in the future coming into our field Okay, thank you. And apologies for my internet cutting out. We're talking about technology. This is what happens when you depend on technology too much. But um, just to say, you know, to start off, I mean, I what I sincerely hope is that the challenges that I face, which are many, 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 will not be the challenges of the next generation. So my goal is to make sure those challenges are done with and they will obviously face their own challenges. But to say, if we want more youth engagement, one of the studies that we're doing right now is on marine literacy in Sri Lanka. We're just doing a very simple study. And literally, if any of you think back to the textbooks that we used when we were in school, when did we mention the ocean, right? How many of us know that the about the monsoons when we're growing up, the details of them, what months they happen, what do they mean? How many of us know the details of a tsunami? We've gone through it, like, you know, and maybe we're a different generation, but it's part of our collective history, right? So we should understand it more than just the fact that it killed people. We should understand how it happens. How many of us know how much ocean area we have around our island? I mean, the vast majority of people don't. Our lives in Sri Lanka end at the shoreline, which is very strange for an island nation, right? But that's a fact. And that's because from the time we're young, we're not encouraged to learn about our environment and certainly not our oceans. The ocean is not central to any conversation. It's not important. It's 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 out of sight, out of mind sort of a uh, thing, right? So. So that to me is one of the big challenges we have as people who work in the marine environment is that we're not only trying to protect it and make sure that it's safeguarded, but we're also trying to on the way make people understand how important it is that to their own survival and their own lives. In a, it's a foreign space to many people. Like if you talk about a forest fire in, in a different part of the world, immediately people can envision what it feels like because they walk through a forest and they can understand what it would be like if that forest was gone. But when we talk about the ocean, people see it as a tank of water and they don't understand what it's like. You know, if we wipe out the fish, they don't know how many are there. So it's very easy for us not to think about what it would look like if it was barren, right? So that is a very, very challenging thing. And this is where some kind of innovation can be very useful, particularly in the marine environment, to take people to these places vicariously or through technology to ensure that they get a sense of what it's really like so that we can remember that we need this, we depend on it, our lives depend on it, but we also you know, have to make sure that that's not all that the next generation is left with, just videos and documentaries and skeletons in museums, right? Thank you. Uh, 
Dolce. I think you did uh, touch up on a good point. If we can uh, get our youth immersed in the ocean much uh, in a more regular term, we might get more engagement. Uh, I'm not too sure if uh, Professor Sewandi is uh, available, uh, but um, I'll get to Professor Fatiarachi. Uh, as a university professor, you may have uh, quite a bit of experience with students coming into the field. Uh, what do you see as the challenges that our youth face in coming into the maritime field? Uh, it's the same thing what Asha was saying, you know. Um, if people go into the high schools, go to the schools in the villages, they have no appreciation of the ocean. They're in fact scared of the ocean. They don't want to go to the ocean. So how do you actually expect them to go and actually go and study? And they go to university and they want to actually do engineering or some other subjects. And so oceanography or ocean studies is very rare. And, and, and so it starts from a high school, have an interest. You know, in like Australia, people go to the beach, they surf, they swim, they do sailing. So they already have a passion for the ocean. And in Sri Lanka, very few people have that passion to the ocean. So another thing that will happen, you know, um, when, when the tsunami happened or everybody wanted to do research on tsunamis, they wanted to know what happened and whatever. And there was a, everybody wants to be associated with tsunamis. 10 years later, not many people, right? So now what will happen in the next few months, everybody wants to do plastics research. Uh, thank and you, Professor. You have to, yeah. Sorry. And um, then what will happen? Sorry to interrupt. Um, I think we had to uh, keep track of the time uh, as there is another uh, session uh, following ours. Uh, I'm, uh, your, um, what you're saying is, we need to develop an interest in the ocean, uh, specifically in terms of recreation as well. It seems that's what that will what get people more engaged. Um, I think uh, because of the time, it's I have to conclude today's session, um, and I would like to thank our expert speakers for coming on. Um, the professor one is here frozen. Um, uh, connector connection is not available, but um, yes. Uh, moving on, I'd like to thank our exclusive patron, the EU delegation um, in Sri Lanka, the summit partner, Dilma Conservation and Kiel, and supporting partners, Classic Cycle. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed and learned, uh, learned more about uh, innovation that is behind research and exploration uh, in the ocean, and uh, how all of us can be part of the learning and conserving our ocean. Uh, please stay tuned for the rest of the summit as we will talk more about a uh, lot more about the ocean. Uh, and our next session is on inspiration from marine conservation organizations. And we will start in 15 minutes. I'd like to thank Dr. DeVos, Dr. Se Professor Sewandi, and Professor Patiarachi for joining us today session. Uh, I wish you all and the expert panelists a very good day ahead. Thank you all. Thank you.